The Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Corn School. Today I'm at the Mary Hill Research Station catching up with BASF's uh, Rob Miller, sir. Good to see you. Great to see you, Bern. Hey, I want to talk about um, weed control. It's that time of year. And I'll tell you what, first of all, I want to go back to last fall. Uh, we've done videos and we've talked a lot about it over the years. The need for fall weed control and what you can achieve when you get out there and get some fall weed control done. This is a perfect example. Just describe this field. Yeah, so last fall, as you remember, wide open fall, perfect conditions, earlier harvest. We had a really good opportunity for fall weed control. And this particular case, this is after wheat, cover crop oats, and the entire field had fall weed control. The only part uh, on this side actually had uh, an extra tillage pass done after that fall weed control. But you can just see, we are clean setting ourselves up for success. We're not trying to chase weeds, especially some of those larger perennial weeds that have the larger taproot. We're setting ourselves up for success this year and, and also managing some of those perennial weeds. So it's not only just the dandelion, it's the flea bane, the chickweed, um, the shepherd's purse, all those weeds are controlled. Yep. And yes, we do have to continue to monitor them. We're gonna have some annual flushes here, but you know, we're setting ourselves up for success and one less thing to do during that busy spring. Now, Rob, we got some good work done here. Just before we go on, I want to talk about this tilled field here. Um, it looks good, but you might have a little issue going for it. Yeah, so we do have a little bit lighter soil here at this research farm. So we're able to actually get in and do some early spring tillage because we're going into some spring cereals. And in this particular case, we didn't have the opportunity to do as much fall weed control. We're starting to see the field violet, the shepherd's purse, the flea bane starting to grow in clumps. We did that high speed disc tillage pass, you know, work the soil up really nice, it leaves some of these clumps in the soil. So that's where, if we do get a little bit of rain here at the late of, uh, at, towards the end of April, it's going to start to reroot themselves and then there's going to be an issue in crop. So that's where the importance of fall weed control really pays off, especially setting yourself up for the following spring. Now I want to look across the road here at some, some plots. I see some corn here. Um, not as pretty, not as tidy, um, not as nice, but you got some work to do. Yeah, so the corn came off a little bit later, so we didn't have the opportunity to get in there with the fall weed control. But you can see that there is some shepherd's purse, some chickweed, some flea bane, some dandelions. We're still late April. Once we get a little bit more heat, once we get a little bit more sun, you can start to see them starting to flower. So the shepherd's purse is actually starting to flower already, along with the chickweed. And I always call chickweed mother nature's cover crop. So it tends to, especially in the end of spring, it'll basically that perfect ground cover and start to flower. So chickweed has been uh, around. We get a lot more phone calls about it, uh, but that's where fall weed control is extremely important for that. Not only controlling some of the glyphosate resistant weeds, but some of these other oddball perennial weeds that we're starting to see more of. Mm. Now, um, let's talk about strategy here. Um, you know, pre-plant incorporated, pre-emerge herbicides, you know, really some tools you, you, you're gonna use in this field. Um, talk about strategies here. It's um, it's late April, not too bad, but you know, uh, timing is interesting. So timing is very important. So we always want to get the herbicide on prior to corn emergence, because if that corn emerges with the weed at the same time, it's going to alter its growth and, and actually put more energy into vegetative growth into, instead of putting it into root mass. So that's where we want to get out there, spray it prior to the corn coming up. But really, when we think about it, we're late April, we have uh, we really just want to get the soil applied herbicides out to canopy closure. And so that's where if we're spraying it mid or late April, we are asking a lot of that soil applied residual chemistry because we are still probably eight weeks away from canopy closure. If we spray it today, we're the corn's still going to be sitting in the ground for about two, three weeks before it starts to emerge. So yes, it's always really good to get that job done. Uh, we do have a little bit of extra time because crop canopy is by far your best means of weed control. So we're just carrying it through till that crop canopy stage. But if you have good ground conditions, you want to get a weed and feed situation with that nitrogen, now is a really good opportunity. So just be aware that if you are coming in earlier, say like that mid or that late April time frame, you might have to come back in right prior to canopy closure and touch up any weed escapes, which is sound weed management strategies. So we're looking at controlling some of those later flushing weeds, some of those perennial weeds maybe, some of the, the south thistles, some of those oddball weeds that are really tough to control. Um, so that's where we're really looking at 
that sound weed management strategy, setting yourself up for success. So Rob, let's talk some of the fundamentals. Um, you always talk about resistance management and multiple you know, modes of effective action in the tank. Yeah, so multiple modes of effective action is extremely important. You also need to understand your soil type. So that might limit you with some uh, classes of chemistry, especially I'm thinking of metribuzin on some sandier soils or some lower organic matter soils. So try to incorporate as many multiple modes of effective action products as you can select the rate that's required. Yeah. So a lot of these times, especially when we get into more uh, commodity prices that have softened a little bit, people tend to shave that rate of glyphosate back to 0.67 liters per acre rate. And sometimes with some of these larger, tough to control weeds, you really have to maintain that those glyphosate rates high. So select the rate of that you need. Timing is extremely important. It's always important to spray it on smaller, actively growing weeds, then trying to chase some weeds later on. And wham legs, right? Wham legs. Wham legs is extremely important, especially as we're mixing some of these concoctions, you know, two, three, four, even five products in the same tank when we're dealing with some IP soybean concoctions. Follow wham legs, but always check the label first because you don't want to be plugging up that sprayer and having that uh, downtime. Yeah. Final thoughts on grass control. Perennial grasses, bluegrass, you've seen a lot of it. Um, what do you tell the growers? Probably the number one question that we're getting from growers is like you said the perennial grasses and that's where it's also important to maintain those higher rates of glyphosate probably have to add in some extra adjuvants in there as well depending on the species we do have some various bluegrass species out there so we have annual bluegrass we have rough stock bluegrass that's why weed id is extremely important but probably the most important thing that we've seen the last couple of years is that we're getting a lot more questions on the perennial grasses. So last year was a bad year for red top grass. We're seeing a lot more of the downy bromes and some of these oddball perennial grasses. And that's what we're actually seeing in the field right now this time of year in some patches. So we're putting so much selection pressure on the glyphosate, especially in these herbicide tolerant uh, soybean platforms with the dicambas and the 2,4-Ds, they don't have any activity on grasses. So that's where we're starting to see some of these weed shifts and starting to get more questions on these perennial grasses. So if you do have some of these perennial grasses, number one thing, make sure you get them tested. Make sure you get proper ID is extremely important. Uh, check to see if there are any type of resistance there as well. And if you're dealing with something like a annual rye grass, you want to get it spray it when it's smaller, actively growing, before it starts to joint, making sure it's not resistant biotypes because we are starting to see some of those resistant biotypes in Ontario. ID is important, get it when it's smaller, actively growing. And when you spray it at this time of year, late April, it's gonna be slow. Yeah. So it's gonna be a uh, probably about two to three weeks before you even start to see any type of symptomology depending on environmental conditions. So uh, make sure you use multiple modes of effective action. Weed ID is important and definitely ask yeah. for. Well, some super weed insights, Rob. Uh, always great to have you on the Corn School. Thanks for uh, taking time. Thanks for having me.